As Mike mentioned, we had a marriage seminar this weekend, The Art of Marriage. We did a couple hours on Friday and then a longer session on Saturday. And you know, I'll admit, I didn't really want to go. I signed up because I'm an elder. I thought, if I'm the first one to sign up, then everybody else will sign up, right? But now, I wish the rest of you had signed up. Because, you know, it's like I've mentioned before, when I used to go and do guided confession with questions, you realize how much more sinful than you think you are, right? I mean, because <laughs> it starts asking you, how do you treat your wife? You know, when you come home, are you too tired to play with your daughter? Are you, you know, and so you start to reflect on these things. And that was the case for me in the marriage seminar. There was so much good information, and it was really amazing because they mixed kind of dramatic scenes with biblical teaching, and so it kind of hits you on all different levels. And they had really big-name pastors and scholars involved in the videos, so it was easy for someone to say, wow, these guys are credible. They know what they're talking about when it comes to the Bible or these counselors who've been doing marriage counseling for 30 years, you know. But they kept giving us things to reflect on. And as I mean, I hope everyone who was there will reflect on them in the coming week, and maybe weeks, but I plan to. I took a lot of notes, and I was realizing that, you know, I have a good marriage. I love my wife more than when I married her. I don't know. I mean, she said afterwards that she learned not to get married, but I think she was joking. But, <laughs> you know, we're pretty happy most of the time, but there are a lot of ways that I could be a better husband. There are a lot of ways that we could have a stronger, more fulfilling marriage. So that's what I think the value is in doing something like this once in a while, even if you have a pretty good marriage. Anyway, we have the videos. You can always take them home and watch them with your spouse. You can buy a book. Now, the, book doesn't, the new book doesn't quite match up with the old video when they tell you what page number, but that's okay. You can work it out, or you can buy a new video. But we, can, we have it for small groups. We have it for you to borrow from the library if you want it. Did anybody else have something they, like a praise report they wanted to say about the marriage seminar? Somebody who was there? Come on. That's right. See, what you all don't realize is you didn't just miss all this good teaching. You missed really good food cooked by Judy Silkmitter, right? So, <laughs> and we had a lot of, we had four helpers in the child care area. And I mean, Sophia came home Friday night and said, why was it over so fast? That's how much fun she was having. So that was a real blessing, both the food and the child care and the getting to talk with each couple between the videos. All that was good. And thank you, Bart and Ashton, for putting it together. Bart will say Ashton did all the work, but Bart got up there between videos and talked to us a little bit, and he did a great job with that, too. And today he was up here on stage singing. Did you notice that? So that is an example, leading by example, of stepping out in faith and trying new things. So praise God. Anybody else? Any other? Oh, Brady, you got a praise report? Here comes your microphone. Uh, I wanted to thank the church body for praying for my dad uh, this weekend. He had he went in for a triple bypass, ended up having a quadruple bypass. Um, that was Friday, most of the day Friday then. And then when I went to see him yesterday morning, he was sitting in a chair and completely coherent in a lot of pain. Uh, it's just remarkable to see what God has done. So yeah, praise thank you God. for your prayers. Praise God. Anybody else have a praise report or an expression of thanks? So this summer I'm working at Camp Hiawatha over in Park City, and it's just a day camp. So it's like punk Bible camp, like a Bible camp, but they, the kids just don't stay overnight. But anyway, so as counselors, we have to teach the chapels. We get to teach the chapels. And <laughs> so part of the summer it's like some of the kids don't look like they're listening, so it's kind of discouraging. But this week we got a call from a grandma who... 
um, her granddaughter came over and explained all the Bible stories to her, like all these chapel lessons, and her grandma was able to lead her to dedicate her life to Christ this oh, week. So that was really encouraging, and so I would also appreciate your prayers. That's a praise report. Yeah. And also appreciate your prayers for our other campers as we continue for the last three weeks of the summer. Yeah, praise God. That's wonderful. Were th- is there anybody, any of you kids or teens that were here, are here, and went to Ponca the last two weeks? Micah, you want? Would you like to tell us something about camp? Oh, come on! What was your favorite thing at camp? You went to a hike on a hike to Lost Valley. Wow, that does sound like fun. I love hiking, especially you were in mountain area, right? Awesome. Anybody else from Ponca? No. All right. Any other praise reports at all? Dallas. Keeping you running today, Ryan. Front, back, front, back. Just have a praise report from, I know my mom had talked last time about my uncle and the funeral and everything and how well that went. Um, Praise report that I've got is just thankful for God's protection. Uh, Coming home from the viewing, uh, we were driving down Dodge Street and passed through an intersection and a car had turned through the intersection immediately behind us. And there was a drunk driver that was weaving in and out of tra- traffic very quickly and ended up impacting the car right behind us real hard. Um, showered our vehicle with debris, and the lady that got hit um, went backwards into a pool, caught on fire, and, and passed away. Um, and so that was something that uh, just really thankful for God's protection and just really thankful for his, uh, just the constant reminder that life is precious. And so being up there for a funeral and then having that, um, it was just a good, not a good thing, but it was, it was a good example to show my family that nothing's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just real thankful for that, uh, that he protected us. Yeah. So. Thank you. And I know it's been a couple of weeks, but I went on vacation immediately after but two weeks ago, we had eight people baptized, so that's something to celebrate, right? We did celebrate. We had a great meal afterwards, but we can still rejoice that those eight people were able to be baptized. And we have a family joining our church today, the Regeer family, Dan and Amanda, and their children. So Dan just waved. Yeah, praise God. Well, let me pray. Father, thank you for all these praise reports and all the reasons we do have to be thankful and to praise your name. I pray that you bless us this morning, that we can sense your presence and that we'll be lifted up by you. We pray for the campers here in Park City as well as down in Ponca, that you would bless them with a great experience of your presence and that you would minister to them through their volunteers, their counselors and staff. We pray this morning as we go into the sermon that you would speak to us through your word and help us to understand what we need to understand. And Lord, thank you that we can come to church this morning, that we have that freedom, and that we have the desire to be here with each other. Help us to lift each other up and to glorify you in everything that we say and do this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So where there seems to be a backward shift. Is that my red shirt? Y'all sat, it's so bright, you all sat farther back today. Where are my teenagers that always sit in the front? They must have known I was going to pick on them today. Well, that's all right. I have money for them too, and they're not here. So, you know. Did either of you bring a Bible? Can you find John chapter 7? We'll give you like 30 seconds. Dun, 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 dun. Pressure. Who's going to count? Dun, dun. Did you find it? Oh, it's a dollar for you. Do you have a cell phone with you? That's your cell phone? Oh, <laughs> do you have a Bible app on your cell phone? Yes. Yeah? Show me. Which one do you have? Olive Tree and U Version. Yes. All right. Well, I'll give you $2 because you got, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Samuel. Do you know any 
Bible verses from Moana last year? Oh, no. You don't have to say it if you don't want to. You want a dollar? <laughs> oh, see? That's George Washington on there. John 3.16? What is it? Well, (laughs) (laughs) sounded good. I don't know. (laughs) Very good. Very good. Hmm. Does anybody know a memory verse from the Gospel of John that we've been going through since the beginning of the year? One verse. Yeah, in the beginning was the Word, right? The Son of God existed in the beginning, and he was with God, so he's different than God the Father. And in fact, then it stresses in the Greek, it says, and guess what? And the word was God, or he was divine. Five dollars for memorizing something from John. One for my daughter, so I don't get yelled at when I get home. (laughs) My daughter lost her first tooth. That's her praise report. I can't believe she didn't raise her hand. I want to say that. Look at that. There you go. All right. So do you all remember, there used to be a TV show, a game show called Let's Make a Deal. And I don't remember everything about the show, but they would do this kind of thing at the end. They'd go out and, and they'd say, excuse me, Sharon, if you have a paper clip in your purse, I'll give you $100, you know? Crazy stuff like that. I'm sorry we had to go low budget. It was my money today. <laughs> Wasn't going to go get hundreds, but... Also in that show, if you won a prize, you could later trade it in for what was behind one of three doors or one of three curtains. And if you picked the right door, the right curtain, you could win a new car. That's always how they say it, right? A new car. But if you picked the wrong door, well, then you got a mule or two goats. Now, I know we're in farm country. Some of you think that's the better prize, but in the show, it wasn't, okay? Well, I used to play a version of this game with my students when I taught college economics. We'd have a game show night, to prepare them for the upcoming test. And every time they got a, an answer right, I would flip them a coin, probably a quarter. I was pretty cheap. So I'd flip them a coin all night long. And then at the end, if they wanted to, they could trade in however many coins they had won for one of several mystery envelopes. So one person would get a free Chick-fil-A sandwich, and another person would get a $5 bill. And one very lucky person would get a signed photograph of the professor. And it was really funny to watch their facial expressions, especially if some young studly man won this prize, right? One kid actually ripped it into shreds and threw it up in the air. That wasn't nice, but anyway. Well, Jesus asks us to play something like, let's make a deal. You already have won some reason to feel good about yourself based on your own efforts. Maybe you've successfully raised children or you've been successful in your career. Maybe you've accumulated enough wealth to retire. Maybe you're very popular, or you're skilled in some special way, or you've done some accomplishment you're proud of. Maybe you have influence here in the church or in your broader community, or maybe you've just endured, right? You're, you're up in your 70s, 80s, 90s, and you're still going. I had a neighbor in Florida. She used to call herself a tough turkey because she was still going in her mid-90s. Maybe that's you. I'm sure everyone here could find some reason to feel good about themselves. Jesus asks you to trade that in for what's behind door number one. You see, in Jesus' game, there's only one door. And he's even willing to open the door and raise the curtain and let you see what the deal is. He will offer you his righteousness, forgiveness for your sins, reconciliation, a real relationship with God and eternal life in his kingdom. And all you got to do, if you want this deal, is give up your sense of self-value, self-righteousness. Jesus wants you to admit that without him, you have no righteousness, that you have no value based on your own efforts that you need what he has to offer, and you believe he can offer it because he is the divine Son of God, and he is the Messiah, the Savior, the Christ, prophesied about in the Old Testament who would come 
to die for your sins. Now maybe some of you have questions, doubts about this deal. That's what I want to talk about today. Questions and doubts about Jesus. Now my comments today are going to be based on John chapter 7. We have gone through that chapter verse by verse over the past few weeks. If you would like help studying John chapter 7 or any of the six chapters before that, I encourage you to go to our church website. You can listen to the sermons. You can download the materials. Today, we're going to talk about one issue found throughout this chapter. We see in John 7 a series of confrontations as people tried to figure out if Jesus was who he said he was. That is the Savior, the Messiah or Christ, the divine Son of God, the prophetic Son of Man. And this issue is just as important today as it was back then. Of course, back then, Jesus had provided a great deal of evidence of who he was during the previous couple of years of his ministry. I mean, for one thing, he had done numerous miraculous healings, miraculous exorcisms of demons, other miracles like walking on water. These were signs. They related back to Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And Jesus partially fulfilled those prophecies to show that he was the one who would bring complete fulfillment in God's kingdom. Jesus also fulfilled other prophecies like being born in Bethlehem. His teachings glorified God and showed insight into God's character and heart. He exhibited a selfless and, and servant approach to life which glorified God. There was the testimony of John the Baptist, a true prophet from God, and even testimony from God the Father himself who spoke audibly from heaven at least twice during Jesus' years of ministry. And then as evidence, Jesus could offer the life change in his followers and let me tell you, they were hard cases when they came to Jesus. I mean, we're talking about corrupt bureaucrats, prostitutes, burly fishermen, maybe even ranchers and farmers. Tough, rough characters. But despite all this evidence, people were struggling to believe in Jesus and the deal he was offering. At the start of John chapter 7, Jesus' brothers were mocking him. And then it says in verse 5, For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Now Jesus' brothers, they might have been skeptical because of familiarity, right? I mean, can you imagine if your own brother at age 30 suddenly started saying he was the Son of God, the promised Messiah, Savior? I mean, I can picture my sister's face if I had tried to pull that off. Sometimes it's hard to convince your family to take you seriously. Did anybody here come to faith like late in your teens or later in life than that? Come on, nobody? None of you came to faith later in life? Okay, so you just don't, all right. It's going to be that kind of morning. Well, I just wonder how many of you experienced what I did. That when you tried to explain your new faith to your family and your friends, they weren't just skeptical about Jesus, they were skeptical about you and about whether this was real for you. You know, I majored in economics in college, and then I went on to graduate school at Georgetown. And when I would come home to my family, and we would gather around the table to eat and argue, as big Italian families often do, I found that they were not interested at all in my opinion about the economy. They still saw me as little Billy. And despite the fact that I had seven years of education about economics to their zero, they were quite convinced they knew more about economics than I did. And it was pretty much the same when I went to seminary. I mean, I think for most of my family, if you compared our Bible study habits, I would have at least a thousand to one ratio advantage in Bible study hours. But do you think that they believe I have any insight into spiritual matters? A few of them do, but most of them don't. And it was the same for Jesus. This is what he was up against with his brothers. I'm sure it was very hard for him emotionally to see his family not believing. But to his brothers, he was just one of them who suddenly got delusions of grandeur. They thought he'd lost his mind or was playing some kind of game. 
I'm sure what kept going through their head was, how could our brother turn out to be the Christ? The religious leaders also had questions. In John 7, 15, it says, Then the Jewish leaders were astonished and said, How does this man know so much when he has never had formal instruction? So we see that one reason they doubted his teaching was because he hadn't been taught by them in their schools. But they also doubted him because he taught the law with a different emphasis than they, because he mocked them when they tried to trick him in theological argument, and because he called them not-so-friendly things like a satanic brood of vipers and blind guides. Have you ever had a job or a position in any organization where most of your supervisors were kind of antagonistic towards you? I had a hard time gaining credibility in my first banking job. You know, most of the people they hired were fresh out of college, and they were accounting or finance majors. I had a graduate degree in economics. I was older, and I had interned in the U.S. Senate for six months. I'd been teaching college classes for a number of years. I was used to being a valuable member of a team, but the bank wanted all the new hires to just sit quietly and do almost nothing for a year while they trained us in every aspect of banking. Now, those of you who have gotten to know me over the past year and a half probably aren't surprised that I had trouble sitting quietly, right? And it didn't take very long for all my suggestions, my ideas, to get me into a lot of trouble. Within three months, my bosses were actively trying to get me to quit. They would yell in my face. They started nitpicking my work. They made me a pariah in the bank temporarily so that nobody wanted to work with me. Now, I'll tell you how that ended up some other sermon because it's an interesting story. But this is the kind of environment that Jesus was facing with the religious leaders. They were dead set against him because they saw that he wasn't compliant to their ways. To the religious leaders, at best, Jesus was a rogue prophet who needed to be reined into conformity. But most of them saw him as an upstart, a deceiver, an antagonist to them, and even a blasphemer because he said that God was his father and that he and the father were somehow one in unity. The crowds weren't sure what to make of Jesus. In verse 12, it says, Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He is a good man. And others replied, No, he deceives the people. The crowds had a lot of questions about Jesus. Some thought the appearance of the Messiah should be mysterious and sudden. But they thought they knew where Jesus was from, and he'd been kicking around doing ministry for a couple of years now. Others thought the Messiah should come from a specific place, and they didn't think that was the place where Jesus had come. Most of the people liked Jesus, but the trouble was they couldn't get past the fact that he was a poor man from a poor family, from an obscure village in the wrong county. A lot of prejudice is going on there. In earlier chapters of John, we see they had many questions, like why Jesus went against the religious leaders, why he didn't honor their Sabbath traditions, why he would say things they couldn't understand or teach things they couldn't accept. They were trying to verify whether Jesus was the Messiah, but it was very confusing because sometimes the Old Testament prophets talked about this mighty Messiah king, and other times they talked about a suffering servant Messiah. Were they to expect two Messiahs, two Christs? And if so, which one was Jesus? Maybe the people even wondered things like, why didn't Jesus heal everyone? Why didn't he set up his kingdom when he had the chance? Why didn't he do the things they asked him to do? The same questions most of us have today. I don't know if you've ever faced a situation where you had to impress a crowd of people who don't really know you that well, but if you've ever done public speaking, run for office, taught a class, taken over a group at work, then you know how this is. Over the past couple of decades, I've taught in several different churches. It's been my 
great blessing and opportunity, but I'm sure some of those people, and maybe even some of you today, were sitting there thinking, who is this guy? Why should I listen to him? Why does he think he has something to teach me? And this is what Jesus faced from the crowd. Many questions, many doubts. It seems just about everyone had questions about Jesus. But you know what? Those questions could have been a good thing. They could have been a good thing. They could have been something that helped people get healthy spiritually. Having faith does not mean you have no questions. Having faith means you overcome your questions. I'm going to say that again. You can see it's up there on the screen too. This is really important. Having faith does not mean you have no questions or doubts. It means you overcome your questions and your doubts. Even Jesus' closest disciples had questions. They wanted to know why he would speak to a Samaritan woman because, you see, most rabbis wouldn't speak to a Samaritan or a woman. Jesus was different. About midway through his ministry to the people of Israel in Matthew 13, the disciples came and said to Jesus, why do you speak to the crowds in parables? And then they asked him what the parables meant because they couldn't understand them either. They wanted to know if they could call down lightning strikes on people and why they couldn't accomplish some of the things Jesus sent them out to do. At the Last Supper, when Jesus explained he was going to die and be resurrected, it says in John 13 and 14, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be content. Even at that late date, after all that time walking with Jesus day by day by day and hearing his teaching, they still had questions. They still had confusion. You might have heard people refer to one of the apostles as doubting Thomas, right? I feel for Thomas. I think he's much maligned. When Jesus appeared after his resurrection to the apostles, Thomas was absent. And when Thomas heard about this, he said in John 20, 25, unless I see the wounds from the nails in his hands and put my finger into the wounds from the nails and put my hand into his side where Jesus had been stabbed, I will never believe it. This is one of the apostles. Even after all of Jesus' teaching about how he had to die and be raised again, Thomas had doubts. Jesus did not condemn Thomas, however. Instead, he let Thomas see the reality of his presence, which strengthened Thomas's faith such that Thomas diligently served his Lord the rest of his life. What we should take to heart, though, is what Jesus said afterward to Thomas. This is 2029. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are the people who have not seen and yet have believed. Are you still waiting to see? Are you waiting for more evidence? Or are you ready to believe? If you're not yet a believer in Jesus, you must have many questions. Most likely that's why you're here. Unless your parents just dragged you here. But you want to get some answers. You want to know who was this Jesus? What did he really say and do? What evidence is there that he was the divine son of God and the promised savior? I'm glad you're here with us. We try to make this a safe place to ask your questions. Please feel free to talk to me or to talk to anybody here if, if you know someone who's a spiritual, mature person. Feel free to share your questions and your doubts, and we'll help you. We don't think there's any shame or embarrassment in having questions or doubts. And I'm sure every believer in this room has questions too. I have questions. Even after investing all those thousands of hours into Bible study, I still have questions. Every seminary class I took, I would answer some questions and come up with more. 
One of my professors pointed out, God didn't give us a systematized theology book, right? Where you could say, well, here's my question. Let me go to the index. Aha, page whatever, and there's the answer. Instead, God gave us the Bible. The Bible filled with prophecy and proverbs, songs, letters, essays, all different types of literature. Because God apparently thinks there's value in our struggle, our struggle to understand his revelation. Our questions can be good and useful because it is in seeking the answers that we grow spiritually and grow in our understanding. So dust off those Bibles, my friends. How about you read one page, one little chapter of the Bible a day, and if you're new to this, then start in the New Testament. Learn everything you can about Jesus. I would suggest you also keep a notebook where you write down the questions you have as you go along because if you read the Gospels, you will have questions. So write them down. And then when you've completed the New Testament and you have a notebook full of questions, read through them, circle a couple that really, really matter, and come talk to me. Our questions can be good and useful. But in John 7, they're harmful. And Jesus gave some reasons why people were struggling to believe. First, they didn't like feeling the conviction that they were sinful. So they reacted with anger and denial, just like people do today. Jesus said to his brothers in verse 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it, that its works are evil. Second, they were not pursuing God. In verses 17 through 19, Jesus told the religious leaders they were having trouble seeing that he was genuine because they weren't willing to do God's will and they were not obeying God's law. They were not right with God. They were self-involved. And third, they were not discerning. In verse 24, Jesus told them they looked at the appearances of things and they thought like the world, not like God. And so they had no discernment about spiritual things or about people. What's at issue is our attitude. Ask yourself this. Are you honestly trying to understand, trying to understand God's will and who Jesus is? Or are you just trying to justify your skepticism or maybe your apathy for those of you who do believe? The people in John 7 were looking for reasons to doubt, not looking for reasons to believe. Now, some of you are here today seeking truth about who Jesus is and what he did. And if you genuinely seek truth like that, I believe God will honor the effort and you will find the truth. But if you just try to prove the validity of your doubts, I think you'll obscure your own opportunity to see truth. And therefore, you may never know God you may spend eternity without knowing God. Others of us are here today because we do believe in Jesus as our Savior, but we too can have both good and bad approaches to our questions and our doubts. If we genuinely seek truth and faith, then those questions will not limit us as we continue to walk in faith, enjoying the fellowship of God and growing spiritually. But if we take the wrong attitude if we let our questions develop into barriers to our walk in faith, that'll result in failure to understand the truth, stagnation, becoming jaded in heart, living in bondage to sin, being easily deceived by false teachings, reflecting the world instead of God, and becoming useless in ministry. One year early in our marriage, Leanne and I lost several relatives and our pets to death. And when one relative died, I was deeply moved emotionally and spiritually because as far as I knew, he had never come to faith in Jesus as the divine Son of God and as the Savior who died on the cross for his sins. And so I had to believe that my relative was in hell. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, 
That's physical death and spiritual death. And spiritual death can be eternal, an eternal separation from God. But the verse goes on, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Bible makes it clear God wants us to believe that Jesus was who he said he was and that he accomplished what he said he would in his crucifixion and resurrection. Thus, we receive our salvation. So back then, when my relative died, I lay awake at night. I was very troubled, in part because I felt I really thought I would have had more time. I mean, I had talked about the gospel with him, but I thought I'd have more time. And I really just didn't understand. And so I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would pace the house and I would cry out to God, why? Why would you create my relative knowing, because you're omniscient, knowing that he would never come to faith in Christ, that he would never have your grace and therefore he would go to hell? Why would a loving God do that? Night after night, I struggled with this. I wrestled with it. I was a very unhappy person. As it happened, I was studying in seminary the book of Romans that semester. And we came to Romans chapter 9, and God made his answer clear to me. I'll read it to you. Romans 9, 18 through 24. So then God has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man? Who are you, O oh will, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use? Or some paraphrases say, to put on the mantle and another for dishonorable use to be dashed on the stones. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but from the Gentiles? Well, that's a very challenging paragraph in several ways. But two things leapt out at me when I studied it. One is, we're asking the wrong question. The question isn't, why does God not save everybody? The question is, why does he bother saving any of us? Because we don't deserve it. Why didn't he just wipe out Adam and Eve and start over? Why didn't he just destroy everybody in the flood? Why didn't he do it? At the Tower of Babel, when everybody had turned against him. Why doesn't he bother? Why does he bother with us now? And the other thing was, I have no right to judge God. Remember when I first got here and we were doing Genesis 1 and we said part of the point was to introduce God? That was really the big point. God is the protagonist of the Bible. So Genesis 1 introduces the creator, God. And one of the things we learned about him is God is good. And I told you, you're going to come across things in life and in scripture that you don't like and that you don't understand. And when that happens, you have to go back to this truth. God is good. Even when we don't like what he does. Now I'll tell you, this was not the, question, the answer to my question I was looking for. Right? God didn't make me feel better. I still have my question. I probably always will. I have a theological question. But God's answer helped me overcome that question. Helped me continue to walk in faith. And as I considered how I went through this process, I came up with some principles. First of all, be honest. If you have questions, be honest. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with God. Let him know. He knows already. Be honest with others who can teach you. There is no shame in having questions. But, number two, seek answers. Seek answers in faith. Search 
the Bible. I mean, search it. I grew the most when I had questions I couldn't answer, and I spent hours over weeks searching for those answers. Pray persistently and seek out. We have some good Bible teachers here. Seek them out. Go to their classes. Go to their small groups. Let God teach you through the people he's raised up as teachers. Third, be patient and persistent. Good answers don't always come easily, but good answers are worth the work. You might not have as much time to study the Bible as I do. I get that. I get paid to study the Bible. That's one of the great things about my job. In fact, every day I sit in my office and I think, I'm going to read the Bible and they're going to pay me to do it. This is great. That does not mean you should cut my pay. You don't have as much time as I do for it. But be honest about this too. Don't deceive yourself. You have time. Five minutes. Or ten minutes a day. Five to read and five to think about it. If you honestly can't come up with ten minutes a day for the Bible, come talk to me. I'll help you find that ten minutes. Okay? In fact, we'll study it together for ten minutes. If you... Study the Bible. The more you study, the more you will understand God, the more you will be blessed. I promise you. Fourth, overcome your obstacles to faith. Don't let your questions hinder your pursuit of God or a life of truth. Even though we cannot understand everything about our amazing God, he has chosen to reveal some things to us, and those things are glorious. And they're even more glorious when we adopt them for our own and make them a part of our consciousness and our life. So I'm asking you to overcome your questions, to overcome your doubts. So I searched for some passages on that. The same John who wrote our gospel also wrote some biblical letters. This is from one of them, 1 John 5. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Because the world is constantly attacking our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So despite all the attacks, you persist in faith. John also wrote the book of Revelation. And in chapters 2 and 3, he quotes Christ, who said, To the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the one who overcomes and the one who keeps my deeds until the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. The one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus still wants to make that deal. You too can overcome your questions, your doubts, and put your faith in Jesus, put your faith, your trust enough in Jesus that you walk with him in the light instead of in spiritual darkness. First, keep pursuing truth, okay? Learn all you can about God's character and the truth about Christ for yourself so you can better understand what the issues are and maybe even find some answers. Second, maintain your ethical walk Live righteously. Be passionate about this, about living righteously and representing Christ, even when you're unhappy with God and despite any questions or doubts you might have. Third, believe. Believe in God. Believe in Jesus as your Savior, even though you'll never understand everything about them. It is okay to have questions and doubts, but learn to overcome them and allow them to help you grow spiritually Instead of obstructing your faith, give up your sense of self-righteousness, self-value, self-determination. You know deep down it's hollow, right? Instead, put your faith in God's gift of grace 
in his promise of deliverance, of salvation, of true life through Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the revelation you've given us in John. And thank you that we can pause in our verse-by-verse study of it to go back and reflect a little more on the big picture of what was happening in Jesus' life at that time. Everybody who encountered Jesus was moved. Some were moved to be excited, and yet later they struggled in faith. Some were moved to antagonism right away because they didn't understand him and didn't agree with him. Some, like his family, just couldn't see the pic. You know, how could this be? They just didn't get it. Lord, we ask you to help us overcome these obstacles. We have questions. We have things in the Bible we don't understand. Or things that we've been taught that we just don't, we just struggle to believe it. But we want to know you. We want to have your grace through Jesus. We want to have that true spiritual life that is intimacy with you, a relationship that empowers us, that transforms us, that makes us useful for your purposes. So we ask that you help us to overcome our questions, our doubts, our fears, maybe our social awkwardness at being people of faith sometimes. Lord, help us to truly believe, to trust you and obey you, and to live a life that reflects you and represents you and even reproduces your image in others. We want to bring you glory and we want to know you. We ask that you help us with that and help us to do the things that you have designed to lead us to further growth. We've been studying that too as we mix in sermons on spiritual growth with John and we haven't gotten to it yet but there are sermons on there's points on studying the Bible and learning to pray with some emotion as well as thought and learning to have true biblical fellowship which is different than what's in the world. We already have learned things like being able to submit fully in every aspect of our life to Christ and yielding to the Holy Spirit moment by moment and trusting that you can deliver us from our bondages, whether they are physical or emotional or spiritual, intellectual, that you can set us free. God, we thank you for the life you've given us. Help us to live it out the way you would choose and to become the people you designed us to be. We love you and we're grateful for everything. We praise you this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.